The Godfather, Goodfellas, The Sopranos, Casino, Boardwalk Empire. All fine examples of cinematic and TV excellence. Films and TV shows such as these helped shape the cultural landscape of film. They have helped us glimpse behind the elusive world of organised crime hinting at the violence and brutality of their lifestyle. But what about the real gangsters they are based on? Are they really as ruthless as their on-screen portrayals? And how did the Italian Mafia come to exist and dominate organised crime in America? According to Britannica, the Italian Mafia dates back to Sicily and the late Middle Ages. It is speculated that the Mafia began with honourable intentions as a secret organisation. During this time, much of Sicily and its small surrounding islands had been invaded and occupied by various foreign conquerors. This included the Saracens, the Normans and the Spaniards. The organisation plotted in secret to overthrow these invaders. The Mafia started as hired security. They were small armies hired by landlords to look after their land when they were away. These small armies were known as Mafia, which soon became Mafia. Sicily truly was the Wild West during this time, with no law enforcement whatsoever. But during the 18th and 19th century, the Mafia organised themselves into a structured unit and took control of the land they were guarding. From there, they created and enforced their own laws. This moral code outlasted the foreign governments that reigned over Sicily. The code of conduct they lived by was Omerta. This was a code of secrecy. It meant people were forbidden to ask for outside help for justice for example from the police. It also meant no one was to help authorities solve crimes in any way. This was to ensure justice was not upheld by foreign invaders and instead was kept in the hands of Sicilians. In 1866, Sicily became a province of Italy under Italian rule. Shortly after, in 1870, Rome used the Mafia to help them track down dangerous criminals. This is where the Mafia became adept at corrupting politicians. They began to use their influence to threaten people to vote a certain way. In exchange, their politician of choice would give them favours. The Catholic Church no stranger to barbaric crimes would also enlist the Mafia to look after their property in Sicily. By the early 1900s, Western Sicily had become unified by Mafia rule. The Mafia families and other families or clans joined together to control the economic activity in the area. To join the Mafia, Secret ceremonies were conducted to swear oaths of loyalty to and secrecy of the Mafia. However, when Benito Mussolini came to power in the 1920s, he began to target the Mafia. Thousands were arrested and sent to prison. But after World War II, many were released from prison and so Mafia rule came to power again. Though they held power in western and central Sicily, they began making inroads into Palermo. They began to take control of industry, business and construction in the area, along with extortion and smuggling. It was also after World War II that the Mafia used their expertise in construction to reconstruct Sicily literally building their influence into the island. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, 
the Mafia would spread from Sicily and Italy to the United States. According to the official FBI website, Giuseppe Esposito was the first Mafia member to emigrate to the US when he murdered the Chancellor and Vice-Chancellor of a Sicilian province. However, in 1881 he was arrested and extradited to Italy. In 1880, in New Orleans, a police superintendent named David Hennessy was executed by Sicilian Mafia members. Although 19 were charged with murder, they were all found not guilty. After claims of corruption and bribery emerged, citizens of New Orleans took justice into their own hands and formed a lynch mob in which 11 of the men were killed. It was prohibition above all else that helped the Italian-American Mafia thrive. They had become experts in smuggling and used these skills to smuggle bootlegged hooch across America. This is how Al Capone rose to power with the Chicago Syndicate. However, most people know the Italian Mafia from New York and for good reason. It was here that Italians flocked from their European voyage across the ocean. Early gangs such as the Black Hand Gang and the Five Points Gang were far from the organised machine the Mafia would become. Two major gangs would emerge as the dominant forces in New York. Joseph Mazzaria controlled both of these and in 1928 he tried to garner more power when he tried to take over all organised crime in the US. This was known as the Castellamarese War. However, Mazzaria, drunk off power, was assassinated in 1932. His top soldier, Charles Lucky Luciano, collaborated with Salvatore Moranzo to perform the hit. Moranzo then took control of New York, setting up five separate criminal factions known as the Five Families. The original Five Families were Moranzo, Pofasci, Mangano, Luciano and Gagliano. They would later become the Bonanno, Colombo, Gambino, Genovese and Lucchese families. He himself would be the boss of these bosses. Moranzo set up the hierarchical power structure of each of these families and instilled the old Sicilian rule of secrecy known as Cosa Nostra. He tried to set it up as a corporate-like criminal empire. He even had rules and regulations to settle disputes. Lucky Luciano was named boss of the Genovese family. However, he was not content with this. He sent a squad of assassins dressed as police officers to assassinate Moranzo. From there, he himself seized total control. Luciano helped to advance the Mafia by setting up the commission. This was a collection of Mafia bosses who would rule over the underworld for their collective families. Different crime rackets would be ruled and distributed amongst commission members. They used their influence to gain further power in the country, both legitimate and non-legitimate. For example, they infiltrated and corrupted labour unions, they ran prostitution rings, loan shark, managed construction and took a hold of garment production in New York. They also infiltrated the tough world of boxing, deciding among other things who would get a shot at the title. Have you ever threatened any manager or boxer or promoter at any time within the last 10 years for not carrying out any wishes in the boxing industry? I respect, Your wishes. I respectfully decline to answer a question on the ground that I cannot be compelled to be a witness against myself. You're directed to answer. 
I respectfully decline to answer the question on the ground that I cannot be compelled to be a witness against myself. Mr. Lamata, I believe you have stated before the subcommittee that you got the okay to go into the tank, as they say in boxing, to Fox on the last day before the fight. Is that correct? Yes. I, uh, I uh, said I would lose to Billy Fox if I, if I was guaranteed a championship fight. And I told him that I wasn't interested in the money and that I was only interested in the championship fight. They operated in the shadows under a code of secrecy and intimidation. When intimidation didn't work, they used bribery to corrupt powerful officials in a number of powerful positions. Luciano himself was arrested and charged with running a prostitution ring in 1936. After 10 years, he was released and extradited to Italy. From there, he acted as a middleman between the Italian-American and Sicilian Mafia, bonding links between the factions. During Luciano's sentence, Frank Costello stepped up from underboss to boss when Vito Genovese fled to Italy to avoid a murder charge. However, after a key witness was poisoned, he returned to America. Costello ran the Mafia for 20 years until he relinquished his position after narrowly avoiding being murdered by a hitman sent by Genovese. Genovese then changed the name of the family to Genovese. In 1959, he was sent to prison for conspiring to violate narcotics laws. During his 15-year sentence, he continued to run the organization from his prison cell in Atlanta, Georgia. In 1963, the secret oaths of the Mafia were revealed when Joseph Valachi testified in court. He had recently survived three assassination attempts in prison by the Genovese family when he was labelled an informant. He also murdered a prisoner he believed had been sent to kill him. He spilled the secrets of the Cosa Nostra, including the structure, leading members, codes of conduct, initiation ceremonies, and other members and secrets. He went on to explain that you live by the gun and by the knife, and you die by the gun and by the knife. Yeah. In other ways, now this piece of paper, this what? piece of paper is burnt. Paper is burnt. You light it. Yeah. And then uh, in your hand, you say, well, again, they give you words in Italian, but I know what it meant. In other words, while you were repeating yeah. the words, you were burning this, the paper. Right. This is the way I burn if I expose this organization. And you were, that was uh, uh, you keep symbolic repeating. Of, of the fate that was to befall you if you betrayed the organization. Right. Until the piece of paper burned. You'd be burned to ashes. Right. All right. He is my, what you call, godfather. Then he, he, he picks your finger. Who, who? The Godfather. He picks your finger. He picks your finger with a needle. Makes with a little blood come out. In other words, that's the express the blood relation. Supposed to be like brothers. Uh, that's the letting of blood. That's right. In other words, uh, symbolic of the fact you're well willing to spill your blood. Right. To give your blood, to give your life. He said, uh, uh, we're going to have... Uh, First, we have the boss of all bosses, which is myself. That's then, Mar Maranzana now. Maranzana's talking. Then we have a boss, and then we have I mean, a, a, an underboss, under the boss, and then we have an Ugava regime. He was explaining all this. Now, uh, if, if uh, a soldier, naturally we have the soldier, if a soldier wants to talk to a boss, he shouldn't take the privilege for him to try and go direct to the boss, he must first speak to the governor gene, then the governor gene, and if it's required, it's important enough, 
the governor's union will make an appointment for the soldier. And he went out to explain the rules. This is what I call the second government center. He was telling you how it is going to operate from was, now on. He was uh, describing how it's going to operate. So it was a, a banquet to raise money and also to acknowledge uh, Maranzana as the boss of bosses. Right. They all were paying tribute to him and honoring him. Right. And recognizing him as the boss of bosses. Right. And this was to demonstrate it. Is that correct? What was that, Senator? This was to demonstrate it. That's right. To That's let right. everybody know that right. he was recognized as boss of bosses. Right. Uh, what, uh, what? In 1969, Genovese died in prison. By which time, Philip Benny Squint Lombardo had taken control. He used his underbosses to control the Mafia, taking a more cautious role as mob boss. Thomas Eboli first, who was murdered in 1972. Then Frank Funze Thierry became the new frontman behind Lombardo. He was convicted in the late 1970s for operating a criminal organisation through a pattern of racketeering that included murder and extortion. Then, Anthony Fatboy Salerno fronted as boss until 1985. Then, he and the four other Mafia family bosses were convicted of running a criminal organisation dubbed the LCN Commission. Lombardo then gave control to Vincent the Chin Gigante, who was the person who had tried to assassinate former boss Costello years earlier. Gigante became known as the Odd Father after walking around New York in only a bathrobe, acting oddly and mumbling to himself. However, in 1986, Vincent Fish Cafaro turned FBI informant against Gigante. He revealed that Gigante was the leader of the Genovese family and his act of madness was a ruse to throw off the scent of police. In 1997, he was sentenced to 12 years for racketeering and murder conspiracy. In 2002, he was again convicted for continuing to run the family from prison. In 2005, he died in prison. John Gotti, the leader of the Gambino crime family, also died in a prison hospital in 2002. Crimes by the Mafia included drug trafficking, murder, assault, gambling, extortion, loan sharking, labour racketeering, money laundering, arson, gasoline bootlegging, and infiltration of legitimate businesses, fraud and stock market manipulation. It has been said that the Mafia, hounded by the FBI, have been allowed to flourish again since the September 11th attack. FBI agents were reassigned to anti-terror programs, meaning organised crime agents shrank from 400 agents to 20 or 30 in some task forces. In 2011, 100 mobsters, including the head of the Colombo crime family, were arrested. This helped disprove the myth that the Mafia no longer operated. It has been quite the contrary. Instead of scaling back, they have made new international connections. This included the Colombian drug cartels and Italian factions of the Mafia, most notably in the Calabria region. They have relied more heavily on peddling drugs than traditional Mafia activities in recent years. Since the flash days of the dapper Don Jean Gotti, the Mafia has slipped back into the shadows under the old rule of Omerta. They try and appear much more inconspicuous than days past, and much more so than the brazen street gangs like MS-13 and the Bloods and Crips who actively flaunt their affiliation with tattoos and gang colours. 
In 2019, Frank Cali, who is said to be the leader of the Gambino crime family, was killed outside his home in Staten Island.